Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, when the organizers uh, invited me, uh, in fact, I think I got an email from Jonathan about this as well, he asked that uh, I not give a standard academic presentation. I think all of us were told that, that we'd be wasting uh, a valuable opportunity to speak beyond the ivory tower. So uh, I am definitely not going to be giving you a, a standard academic presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk for uh, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. I'm going to talk about uh, motivation for this, why anybody would care. Uh, I have to do a little bit of history for many, many people in the room that have no idea what a tontine is. Uh, and then I'm going to get to sort of what I'd like to contribute, or me and my co-authors are trying to contribute, which is the optimal design of a retirement tontine. Uh, Mortality contingent claims have been in the news. Uh, I don't have to tell an audience like this that there's a lot of discussion in the public arena around encouraging people to annuitize. In fact, in October of last year, the uh, Treasury Department issued guidance to encourage annuities uh, in 401k plans, to encourage people uh, to uh, purchase uh, annuities. Uh, generally speaking, when you're trying to explain why someone might want to buy a annuity, a life annuity, you tell them that your remaining lifetime distribution uh, is not bimodal. Uh, it's not Gaussian, but it's certainly not bimodal. There is a mean. You know, some of it's a healthy female at retirement can expect to live 25 years. Uh, the standard deviation of life is about 10 years at the age of retirement for a healthy female. For an unhealthy male, it's about uh, eight years. And the issue here is the tail of the distribution, which is uh, this uh, right-hand tail. How do we protect against it? It's a low magnitude or low probability event, a uh, high magnitude cost. How do we protect against it? So how does a tontine work? So I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, think back to the 17th century. Uh, the governments in England or France need to borrow money. And the instrument that they used was this. They issued a tontine loan. And the way this tontine loan worked was as follows. You had an investor, the red uh, bubble in the top left corner, and they would hand the government, the tontine issuer, the sponsor, uh, 100 pounds. This was the minimum unit in the end of the 17th century where you'd be able to buy one of these things. And the government guaranteed that they would pay you a coupon, so to speak, of 10 pounds or 10% uh, per year as long as the nominee that you selected was still alive. So there are three parties to this, the annuitant, the investor who's putting up 100 pounds, the government or the sponsor on the other side of us that's taking all of this money, and then they're committing to pay you the 10 pounds. And as long as your nominee was alive, you'd get the 10 pounds, and you'd get a little bit more than that, and I'll get to that in a bit. But once your nominee dies, uh, the payment obligation ends, and you lose it all. So you want to pick a nominee that's going to live for a very long time, and in most cases, people would pick young females. Now, this isn't a figment of my imagination. Governments borrowed money this way prior to the fixed income bonds that we know today, or even the Bank of England, and I'll get to this in a moment. So here's an example of how this works to set the intuition. Very, very basic. I would even call it actuarial science 101. Imagine that we have 20 participants in a tontine, and the participant is the annuitant and the nominee. So they've picked themselves as the nominee on whose life the payment is triggered. They've just handed over uh, 100 pounds each, so that's 2,000 pounds. They've given it to the government, and the government's going to go use it to fight wars. And what they've promised is, is that they're going to give everybody 10 pounds, and if at the end of the year everybody's still alive, they get their 10 pounds. Now let's imagine that uh, during the course of the year, uh, four of those people have passed away. So we have 16 nominees that are still alive. So what would happen is the government would continue to pay out to this group 200 pounds. So the syndicate would still be getting 200 pounds. They didn't care about how many people are alive or dead. They would send the check to the hotel. All of the participants would show up at a hotel in London, and they'd say, well, how many people do we have here? 16. We split the payment across the 16 people so that everybody then in that year would get 10 pounds plus 2.5 pounds, which is 12.5. Very, very important to point out that the 12.5 that you're getting consists of two components. One component is pure interest, 10 pounds, and the other component, 2.5, is mortality credits. It's explicit. It's clear. Nobody argues about it. You don't have to explain to grandma what a mortality credit is. This is why you got 12.5. The interest rate was 10, but we had four people that died. You do the division. Now, uh, what happens at the very, very end of this? What happens at the end of this? Imagine there are four people left. Well, they're going to get 50 pounds each. 
So the majority of their payments are really these mortality credits, uh, the interest that they had at the beginning, was it 8%, was it 12%, they don't remember anymore, it's irrelevant, they're getting 50 pounds, mostly mortality credits. What happens when there's four people left? So obviously uh, one of them knocks off the other three and we're left with the winner of the Tontine who gets 200 pounds for life. Uh, how long does that continue until he or she passes away and then it's over, it's defeased? No more payment, no principal, no bequest, no legacy. Uh, what happens to the original principal is gone. And is this unfair? Is it sort of arbitrage? No, obviously not. This has been amortized. You did get your principal back. It was split across. Uh, who invented this bizarre scheme? Uh, his name is Lorenzo de Tonti. Some of you may have heard of him, uh, hence the name Tontine. Uh, he was a governor in Italy. Uh, he was involved in a revolt against the Spanish. He sought asylum in France, very interesting entrepreneur. Uh, he writes something called an edict of the king for the creation of the society of the royal Tontine. He proposes this to Louis XIV, or Mazarin at the time, because he was underage. And he's thrown into the Bastille for whatever reason. He dies in poverty, uh, and he never participated in a Tontine. Uh, and I was able to uncover the only known picture of this fellow. Here's Lorenzo Tonti. Lorenzo Tonti. Uh, how does it differ from a life annuity? And, and, and this is where you know, it starts to become relevant to at least today's topic. So how does it differ from a life annuity? Let's think through this clearly. So in a life annuity, as people die, the total paid out to the group declines over time. You know, uh, Tom at Sun Life would never admit this, but as his annuitants die, and if they die faster, he's happy. Right? You know, well, we don't have to pay as much this year. We don't have to pay as much this year. In a Tontine scheme, the government's giving 200 pounds to the syndicate. They don't really care. I mean, they're paying 200 pounds until the last survivor dies. And when that last survivor dies in year 37 or 36 is almost irrelevant on a present value basis. Uh, in the Tontine, the total interest paid to each year, each year to the group is known in advance. You know exactly what you're paying, 200 pounds. Now, on the flip side, the payments to the survivors increase the longer they live, the more they get. Think of that lady at the very, very left-hand corner. She lives, she's getting these enormous payments towards the end. Of course, in a life annuity, conventional, nominal, no cola life annuity, the payments are going to stay relatively constant. Now, this idea of choice now becomes interesting. And if you think of it from the supply side, what's better? What would you issue? And in fact, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations actually devotes a couple of pages to this. And he writes that, you know, after thinking through this, governments should be borrowing money with tontines because tontines are generally preferred because people think they're going to live long so if they think they're going to live longer, they're going to probably buy the tontine versus the annuity. Sort of like a behavioral argument as to why government should issue one versus the other. We're talking about 1770s, 1780s. You know, governments were using these things. Uh, many building societies were using these things. So now comes the audience participation part. I'm going to run a behavioral experiment, and I apologize. I'd like you to imagine a choice. You've just reached retirement. You have a 401k plan. You know that it's important to insure against longevity risk, and your plan sponsor gives you a choice. 14% life annuity. Give us $100,000, we'll give you $14,000 a year for as long as you live. Nominal, constant for the rest of your life. Or the sponsor gives you a choice of an 8% tontine. In the first year, they're going to give you eight grand. But as other people in the group pass away, those payments are going to increase. There is some break-even point in the future where if you get to that point, you probably are going to get more than 14, but it's not going to be for a while. If you had a choice, tontine, 8%, annuity, 14%, with a show of hands, how many of you would say, yeah, I think I would take the tontine. I would take the tontine. How many of you would say, no, I'm going to take the life annuity. I'd like the life annuity with 14%. Now, where are the financial economists here that are supposed to yield diversify, 50-50, maybe split it up, asset allocation? Very interesting. And I've done this in many places, and historically, we see that as well. Now, what would this depend on if you had a choice? Well, if you think about it for more than 30 seconds, you'd say, whoa, whoa, Moshe, who am I playing with? Who's in my pool? I mean, marathon runners, much healthier than me. Thank you very much. I'll take the annuity. Uh, what's the credit rating of the insurance company standing behind the annuity? Right? I mean, who's giving a double B? Thank you. I'd rather take the tontine. It's a constant payment. There's no longevity risk. You know, my risk aversion and consumption preference, temporally elasticity of substitutions, discount rates. I mean, all of these things are going to be important. The term structure of interest rates. I mean, are these fair numbers, the 8 and the 14, on a present value basis? Now, you might think, well, this is a very hypothetical choice, Moshe. You know, nobody really has this choice nowadays. But historically, people had this choice. 
in the year 1693, this is about five years after the Glorious Revolution, William of Orange comes to England. He's now King William III, and he needs a ton of money to fight Louis XIV. He goes to Parliament and he says, I need millions of pounds. And they say, sure. They pass something called the Million Act. And in the Million Act, they give people a choice, investors a choice. You can give the government or Parliament 100 pounds, and you can buy a life annuity that pays you 14% for the rest of your life. This is in 1693. Or you can buy a tontine. The tontine will pay you 10% for seven years. And then after that, it'll go down to 7%. Now, at first glance, you might wonder, gee, that's, that's a weird one. Initially, the coupon's 10%, but then it goes down. Initially, the numerator's 10%, but then the numerator goes down. But when you think about it, what they were trying to do was to levelize expected payments. This is not Tonti's design. In Tonti's design, they grow exponentially. They were trying to levelize them. To make a very, very long story short, I actually have documents on what people selected. They're stored in the National Archives and in the British Library. I was able to find a total of about uh, 2,500 investors. Uh, total investment in the annuity was 269,000 pounds. This is 320 years ago. So add you know, three zeros. This is, this is a very, very big sum of money. Uh, the investment in the Tontine was lower. Uh, about 60% of annuitants are in the annuity. Uh, take a look at the investors. 71% of people in London took the annuity. I have a pet theory as to why, I'll tell you in a moment. 29% of the people uh, are in the Tontine from the London. The outside of London, 65% are in the Tontine. Average investment side, uh, very, very big money placed in the annuity, relatively smaller amounts in the Tontine. The largest subscriber was Sir Robert Howard. He put in 4,200 pounds, meaning he bought many shares of this thing. Uh, large investors, 95% of them went into the annuity. Uh, and, and this is from an article I published in the Financial History Review that sort of looked at these two things. Uh, where did these people get their advice? Well, here's where it gets interesting. Edmund Halley, Haley, Haley's comment, wrote an article in 1693 published in the Transactions of the, Phyllis, of the Royal Society where he talks about this choice. And he actually said, you know what, the 14% annuity is a better deal. Now, this is the article that many actuaries point to as the you know, first article to look at mortality tables and life contingencies. He wrote that partially because he's the secretary of the Royal Society. He gets these mortality numbers. But you could see when you read this, part of this was clearly driven by the choice that people had. I can just imagine Edmund Haley sitting in a coffee shop in London, wealthy investors coming in and asking him, so Edmund, which one would you take, the 14% annuity, uh, or would you take the tontine? Uh, oh, yes, I have to thank the National Archives in the UK for granting me access to this. You know, they have librarians there that help you, and you ask them at the end of this, you know, month stay, how do I thank you? And they say, well, whenever you talk about this anywhere in the world, please thank the National Archives. So here I am uh, thanking them. In fact, uh, I'll go one step further. Here's a picture of me in front of the National Archives in, in Surrey, in London. Uh, there's some of the Tontine documents uh, in the National Archives uh, as well. Uh, and for those of you that are interested, if you didn't guess yet, uh, I am pitching a book that I just published called uh, King William's Tontine, which is uh, the history of this. But I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, something else. So why don't they exist anymore in the uh, four or five minutes that I have uh, remaining? So there's a difficulty with the idea of a centenarian take all uh, philosophy. You know, at the very, very end, somebody's going to get all of this income. But of course, that doesn't have to be that way. The numerator doesn't have to stay constant. You can have the numerator decline. And that's really where I'm going with this. Uh, there are concerns with fraud and possible criminal incentives. You have four people left. One of them murders the other three. There are novels about that. There's a great movie. There's a Simpsons episode of that. So you know, that, that's, uh, you know, there was complaints about investment returns. Uh, I came across articles in the London Gazette in the 1720s and 30s where you have investors in the Tontine writing letters to the Gazette saying, why are my Tontine dividends so low? My Tontine dividends are eight pounds. And, and, and he ends the letter by saying, don't Britons die? Like, why aren't people dying? Where, where am I taunting? So there was an issue of fraud there as well. People were naming their kids, and then the kid would die, and they would bring another kid and say, yeah, yeah, that's Johnny. That, that was the Johnny I nominated back in, in 1693. There was a ban on taunting insurance in the, UK, in, in the US. Some people think it's distasteful, unethical. So let's try to fix this. And that's really where I want to spend my last three minutes or so.
So this is the payoff structure of a Lorenzo Tonti tontine. You get very little early on. You're getting the 8%, your 8%. Then when people start to die very rapidly, you get these big coupon payments. And, and this is not a suboptimal. This is a suboptimal uh, payment stream. Uh, you know, consumption increasing very, very rapidly at the very end. Uh, this is not smooth consumption. There's a wide variation. So how do we fix the payout structure in order to, uh, so to speak, maximize uh, utility? And, and why would we want to do this? Why should we bring something that's been gone for hundreds of years back? So here's my pitch as to why I think these should be brought back. Uh, let's take a look at mortality rates in the US over the last 35 years. So this is for the, from the HMD, Human Mortality Database. This is mortality rates at the age of 85. So you'll see that in 1975, the mortality rate for an 85-year-old was 11.5%. Uh, by the year 2010, the mortality rate has dropped to about 8%. If you blindly and ignorantly st uh, fit a straight line to this and you say, so where will mortality rates be uh, in the future? Uh, you're going down by one percentage point a decade, which means that by 2090, the mortality rate is zero, nobody dies. Clearly that can't be the case. So there's gotta be some sort of plateau. There's uncertainty there. There is mortality risk and longevity risk that's not diversifiable. You can't just sell a lot of these things and hope that it goes away. Which then brings the issue of is there a risk premium? Is the risk premium positive? Is the risk premium negative? That's, I think, a reason to bring them back and give people a choice. Uh, if you were to take a look at uh, the amount that you pay for an annuity, the uh, liability best estimate uh, is the thing all the way in the left, you're paying more than the actuarial present value because they have to add a risk buffer, they have to add a market risk buffer. Uh, you're ending up paying much more because of reserves and capital that the company has to set aside. This is a reason to give people a choice. How would I design the modern day tontine? Well, I wouldn't have it as a straight line. I wouldn't use the uh, you know, King William design, which was declining just once. The black line is what the optimal tontine uh, looks like. Uh, what do I mean by optimal tontine? Well, here's the way I would explain this to people in the field. We solve the Ya'ari model instead of with actuarial notes with tontines. So somebody's trying to smooth consumption as best as they can towards the end of their life. They have no bequest motive. How would they design a tontine that maximizes their discounted utility? And when you work it out, you end up with an expression that looks like that. And I'll point you to the stuff in red, which is the optimal design. It's a probability to the power of a coefficient of risk aversion. So the optimal tontine is one where the, the numerator declines uh, at the rate of the survival probability. If you're more risk averse, it's higher, less risk averse, uh, it would be lower. That's the picture of what it looks like. Did I fix it completely? Do I have perfectly smooth consumption? I don't, but it certainly would be better than the original design. Would someone look at this and say, I'd rather have the annuity if it's guaranteed? Possibly, but if you have to pay a loading, if you have to pay a loading, at some point you say, thank you very much, I'll take my chances with the tontine. I don't want to buy the annuity because it's loaded by 10, 15, uh, or 20%. In conclusion, what's the point of all of this? How do we smooth our consumption and retirement if we don't know how long we're going to live? How do we smooth consumption? Uh, insurance companies will charge and continue to charge for absorbing longevity risk. It is not completely diversifiable. We don't pay the actuarial present value. These capital costs are going to continue to increase, especially uh, solvency two in, in Europe. I think that perhaps there is a role for products that allow me to share this risk. And uh, my time is over, so I will hand it over to the next, uh, to, the ne to John. Thank you very much for your patience. I appreciate it. Okay.